So tonight we are going to be looking at the inhabitants of the hive, the drones, the workers, the queen. Adam's going to touch on that. He's also going to touch a little bit on basic bee anatomy because I think it is important that you recognize why the bee is put together the way it is and how that affects its foraging ability and how that affects the outcome of, of our having honey. I'll talk a little bit about apiary considerations. Trust me, know where you want that hive to go before you put it there because you don't want to go back and switch it around that fall or the next spring. So we'll just talk, we'll highlight some of the key things that should be in the back of your mind before you do that, before you set up your hive. And then we'll be looking at the whole difference between packages and nukes. What are some of the not necessarily pros and cons, but how are they different? <clears throat> Why might someone be interested in starting with a package versus a nuke? What are some of the different management techniques that you might want to consider when you have a package versus a nuke? And our stations will reflect that. So one station with me will be looking at <laughs> installation of package bees from the time that they arrive where you pick them up <clears throat> to, to the time that they're hived. Someone will do a nuke, Adam will be taking the nukes, and then Peter in the back has got a combination of actual frames and some photos. I brought in carefully selected frames from a hive that I had. Out of my 12, I had one dead out. It, I will tell you it was my strongest hive. Um, <clears throat> I've collected the bees. I'm sending them off to Tony to take a look at. I really have no explanation as to why that hive was a dead out. It was very strong. It had loads of honey. But what I did bring in were sections of frame that you can look at and clearly see capped honey, pollen, pollen that looks good, pollen that looks funky, um, brood that's capped, brood that's uncapped. And the significance for you now is that one of the things that they see with the high viral loads is that um, the nurse bees and the worker bees will go and uncover brood that's diseased. They already know that there's something up with that bee that has not yet emerged from the cell. It could have a deformed wing. There's something awry. And you will see cappings that have been scratched or partially removed and the actual bee still in its place. But the whole idea for you is to handle them, look at them, talk about what it is that you see because you'll be able to carry that back with you in spring, summer, and fall. So that's just a quick recap of what we're going to do for tonight. So last week we spent most of the time looking at hives. So tell me, making believe this is our cement block or whatever you want to use, first piece of equipment is what? Hive stand? Hive stand. What if this is my, what if this is what I'm going to put my hive on? Make believe this is my cement, my cinder block. What's my first piece of equipment? Nope. Bottom. bottom board. Right. And so Jean talked to you about we've got a regular bottom board, right? Just plain old wood. And she showed you last week the screen bottom board. What we didn't talk about is that this does come out. <clears throat> That's, thank you for turning that off. Um, one of the advantages of using screen bottom board, I'll wait till the music stops. One of the advantages of using this um, is that you can do a mite count. I love spreading this with Crisco. When I'm looking at treating bees or just wanting to monitor, monitor what's happening in the hive, I cover this with Crisco. Or you can use spray PAM. But just thin layer, it gets put back in. And so whatever mite drop is happening, I can simply take this out and see. Okay. So, and Jean also talked about she, in the summer, takes the bottom out. Is that correct? Yeah. Did, you, did I hear you yeah, correctly? Correct. You do not have to do that. You can if you wish. I run my, <clears throat> I have screen bottom bo boards on all my hives. I leave the bottom in. I love a hot hive. I've always run a hot hive. I never, rarely do I take this out. It stays in, f again, for the reason I'm always watching what's happening. I want the hive to be hot. Mites don't like heat. So I want my hive hot. So you may, you, you may keep it in. What's my next piece of equipment? My deep. Okay, deep goes on. 
I don't remember if the deep that Jean used last week, I don't remember, did it have a hole? Okay, very important, making sure that you have a 5 8 inch ventilation hole. Be consistent in where you put your holes. The significance of doing that is in the fall when you wrap your hive with whatever you choose to use it for winter, whether it's tar paper or some type of commercial wrap, that you know without, a hesit without any doubt that that little hole is an inch off where you're grabbing. So rather than putting one here, one here, decide where you want your hole and be consistent. It just makes it so much easier in the end. Yes? And to be sure that when you drill it, folks, you do it between two frames, not on a frame. Right. And very often you're going to drill before you have anything in, in there. All right. Um, obviously the frames go in. Jean talked about if you're taking a frame out, you always want to put it back in the same order. The other important thing is that if you've taken a frame out to look at and you've done this, that you want the orientation the same. So part of it is just cueing in on where's your left hand. If, if your left hand, whatever, you take it out like this, then left hand is in your front. And you can do whatever you want with that as long as it goes in the same way you took it out. Okay? So assuming that this is a brand new hive that we're starting and we've got bees only in this box, what's the next piece of equipment? Inner cover. Okay. Hole, and there's great discussion about this all the time. This is not the right size. But hole down, up, brand new bees. How do you want that? Down, because why? Because what? Guard, right. If you have a brand spanking bunch of 10, 15,000 bees in there, not a whole lot of bees, and you've got intruders in the neighborhood, and they come in here, they've already made their way in the, in the core of the hive. And there's this huge area where they can then go down, steal, do whatever they want. This really limits their entry. The guard bees are right there. They're anticipating the intruders coming in, and nobody gets too far. So you do want it down like that. And if you're feeding syrup, this is where it's going to go. What, I don't know if Jean talked about this. I, co I commonly put two sticks. I like the height on, my, on the inner cover. When I'm feeding with sugar syrup in the spring, I'm using a bucket. I set the bucket on top of these two sticks. Just gives them a little bit of space. That's all it is. Doesn't matter what size. You can make it as thin or fat as you want. And then next piece of equipment would be another deep, which is filled with frames, followed by top cover, followed by top cover, followed by biggest rock you can find. Good, good. All righty, good. Adam, would you like to take over looking at our beat? You can move whatever you want out of there. Yes? Do you, um, for the winter, when you have a screen bottom board, do you actually put a piece of wood in for insulation or anything during the winter, or do you just leave it with whatever it is? Piece of wood, you meaning the entrance here? Well, Where the uh, entrance reducer? Under there? Under here? No, what I do, because I have, um, my property borders a river. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of wind, even though the hives are, are pretty well protected. What I tend to do is I put like a, um, like a silver bubble wrap. I put it at the base. I just, I kind of, anything to reduce the wind. Because you're right, it's really pretty airy down there. For me, that's, one of the, that's why I, I love these, but I understand why I use these. Yeah, and these, I mean, this fits nice and tightly. I will tell you on some of mine, there's a huge gap that I don't like. And sometimes what I'll do is I will just give a little bit of a, um, just put something underneath it to snug it up. The one thing that I didn't tell you about, um, I didn't mention, and I don't know, Jean, if you did. When, we, when you set up a hive, it's really important to make sure that it's level, side to side. 
did you talk about one of the things that I do, if this is my cinder block, right, I will put a slight rise, maybe an inch, doesn't need to be a lot, in the back, just so that if there's any rain, even though the top covers on it, if there's any chance of moisture or in, in, weather getting in the hive, I don't want it sitting in the corner or in the back. I want, I, want it out. I want the rain to run out the front and not come back in on the hive. So that's where I'm doing my lift. Cement block, lift, bottom board, and then the rest of the hive. But I still have my trusty little level because I want it level side to side. I don't want this kind of action. I don't care if it's tipped up, but I don't want this. If you're yeah. using two bottom boards, though, I would say keep in mind, because some of you will, I've seen some people do a screen bottom board on top of their original, like that. Okay. That's fairly common. Yes. Now you're going to have to tip the hive the other way because the hard opening is to the back of the hive. So you, like you said, you have pay attention to what, what's your setup. If the water is going to run and pool here, then obviously you want to, you know, what, however you set it up is how you have to deal with. So, so always, always good to just watch. How, how the wind's going to go, how the water's going to go. And I'll try and keep this somewhat under control. I, I tend to have a bit of a gift of gab. Don't tell my parents. We're going to try and brush through kind of the basic anatomy really quickly. I won't spend a whole lot of time on it because it's stuff that you can, you can look in the book and see, or online and see huge blow-up pictures and get get really good exposure to that stuff as, as opposed to just listening to me talk about it. But very briefly, um, and in fact, page 18 in your book has a fairly a good diagram of the typical insect we're looking at, the head, thorax, abdomen. And for us, as beekeepers, we're interested in, in the head because it's how they find everything, what, how, they, how they find the flowers, the nectar, the pollen, and that's what we're interested in. Their eyes, their compound eyes, are good for distance and flight. And you'll notice in that description, it's rode the three ocelli that they use for navigating within the hive. And their antennae are what, kind of how they smell what's around them. They're very good. In fact, there was just a, a show on, um, I think, the Science Channel last night where they're starting to train bees to sense toxins and bomb components. And that, even, even fine cadavers. Yeah. that tells you how good, they're better than a bloodhound. And, and so there's, there's all sorts of um, amazing details if you want to dig deep, deep enough. And their, their tongue, or proboscis, is the other thing. It's really, you don't see it most of the time unless you throw some syrup down and you'll, and you'll see them. It unrolls like, a, like those zippy straw toys that we had as kids. And... Uh, in the, the middle part, the thorax, bees are kind of neat. They have four, four, two pairs or four wings, but they're linked or locked when they're in flight, so they act as a single pair, but separate when they land. And the legs are interesting because they, they actually have essentially taste buds on their feet, and they, they actually are able to gather information just by what they're walking and touching, including flowers, or if you put something on the hive, they're going to they're gonna know about it just by walking across it. And the part that we all care about in the back, the stinger, you will get stung. It's not the end of the world. It hurts, but not bad most of the time. And it's interesting that with, with that stinger, the the uh, ability, you'll notice that you'll, you'll see them give instructions on how to take it out because there will be a stinger left in you and you scrape it off. Well, that doesn't happen when a bee stings another bug. It only happens when they sting a mammal with a thick enough skin to hook the barb. When they sting each other in, in when they're fighting other bees or other insects, it, they can sting as many times as they want, just like a wasp could. And we'll try and leave the anatomy there, mostly. But when you look at their, their, their legs, the back legs, um, what we care about, uh, we'll see, you'll see them coming back with 
yellow, white, orange pellets on the, on the sides of their legs, look kind of like little saddlebags. And those are what are referred to as the pollen baskets. They're really not baskets, but they're more comb-like hair arrangements that they use to pack either pollen or propolis and carry it back to the hive. And in, fa in fact, I think the, it's equivalent to you or I putting a 50-pound weight on each leg. So there's some, there's some power there. And the pollen obviously is important as a protein and nutrition source for the hive, and even people uh, use it. And the propolis is actually sap or resinous compounds from plants. Most common would be like popple would be one of their, most fa their, their favorite. And they use that to plug up holes in the hive, stop air leaks, but also it's a disinfectant or antibacterial. So anytime, and they actually coat the entire surface of the hive with a very thin coating of that. And it's to help prevent disease within the hive. And in fact, people are starting to realize that and try and, and collect it. Some bees used to be, that was a quality that people hated in bees, was bees that made a lot of propolis. And now people, some people are looking for bees that make a lot of that because they use it in um, beauty and healthcare products. The other, the other aspect um, that we have to pay attention to are, and you'll notice in the book, it was talked about the different pheromones that the bees use in communicating. Uh, first, the workers use, there's two pheromones that we pay a lot of attention to. One they call, it's the Nazanoff or it's kind of their, their homing beacon scent. It's like, this is my hive, this is what my hive smells like. And, you'll, and there's a good picture in the book, and you'll, you'll see them right on the bottom board, raise their abdomen up and fan their wings. And that's to spread that scent into the wind to guide foragers home. Say, you know, this is where we're supposed to be. And when, you, when we get to talking about hiving packages and nukes, you'll notice that right away. Anytime you disturb a hive and dump bees in a new place, Lots of them instantly set about throwing that scent up so everybody can find where the rest of the hive is. The other pheromone is the alarm pheromone that they use to alert um, each other if there's danger or if there's an attack. And it elicits, in varying degrees, the same response from, from the other worker bees. And it's not like, and it, and it varies depending on the situation because it's not like if one bee sets that off, you're going to have a killer bee style swarm launch out of the hive and attack you. It just encourages those around it to pay attention to what's going on, something bad might happen. And also you'll notice that when you do get stung, because that bee spills its guts when it leaves, that now that, that sting site is very interesting to the rest of the bees as you're working the hive, and you're more likely to get stung in that spot because it's kind of painted a scent bullseye on you, a perfume bullseye that says, somebody killed me here. Stop him. <laughs> but again, it's not the situation where you're going to have thousands of bees erupting out of the hive to attack you. They just, they, it's not that radical uh, a reaction. And so, you know, you can, some people smoke a sting wound, some people rub, like, a plant juice on it because um, plantain, I don't know if you've seen it in your lawns, if you chew that up and rub it on, it, it kills the sting. But, and other people just pour honey. It's like if, if they want to sting you, they'll change their mind because there's a free meal. That's kind of sticky as far as I'm concerned. But, but with the, the, the pheromones that we really talk about a lot when you're reading bee books are queen pheromones. And there's multiple pheromones that, that work on the hive. And when they're outside the hive, the primary uh, purpose of her pheromone is to attract drones for the purpose of mating. It's, but inside the hive, her scent is spread throughout the hive by the workers, and it lets them know that there is a queen there, that she is laying eggs, and it stimulates them to do normal hive activities. Um, so an absence of a queen is noticed within a matter of hours at most in a hive. They, they, can, they can tell that she's missing. And it sets up a series of reactions in the hive that we'll get to 
later on in the school when they when you talk about swarms <coughs> and swarm prevention they'll, they'll discuss that in more detail but there's also an important um, pheromone that even the developing brood gives off that brood pheromone is also important to the workers and actually acts to suppress the ovary development of the workers so it keeps the workers from being fully developed so that they compete with the queen even though they've never made it. And while we're talking about them, the queen, there's usually one per hive. She lays up to or even exceeding 1,500 eggs a day in the, in the height of the season, which exceeds her body weight. She has a stinger, but you will hardly ever get stung. They they're primarily reserve their stinger for killing other queens. And their stinger doesn't have a barb anyway. And they can live for two or more years, which is a long time in a, in a bugs, in the, in the insect world. The workers are also all females, but their ovaries aren't fully developed. And this is suppressed both by the presence of the queen pheromone and, as I mentioned, that brood pheromone helps keep that from developing. And on pages 27 through 29, I'll run through it real quick. Um, there's kind of the life cycle of a worker bee. And it, and, it, and it really helps us to appreciate how adaptable, how versatile they are. But as you're looking through the hive, recognize that they, the, there are these various different jobs that they engage in. And for the first three days, they actually engage in housekeeping, cleaning. And in fact, one of their first jobs is to clean their own, the own, their own cell that they hatch from. Uh, hmm? Oh, I've got an old book. Okay. I, I'll stop using the page numbers. I wondered why when Jane's pages didn't match mine. It's like... And... Um, for days 3 to 16, one of the jobs is undertaking or removing dead bodies of other bees or diseased bees, as Jane mentioned, that bees will even recognize a diseased brood or something wrong with another, with another worker and re remove it from the hive. Overlapping this, we have 4 to 12 is nursery duty, taking care of brood and, and, other, and young bees. 7 to 12 is attending the queen because she's actually incapable of taking care of herself. So they clean and feed her. Um, 12 to 18, they are actually ferrying nectar and pollen from the returning foragers. So those bees can turn around and take back off. So we see an efficiency there. They're not ready to go do the job, but they can take it from the returning foragers and go put it away while they go back out and risk their lives again. Uh, 12 to 18 is fanning duty. It sounds, it sounds funny, but it's, it's pretty important and pretty impressive. They're actually controlling the thermal qualities within the hive by controlling airflow. They will station themselves at the various openings around the hive, whether you have top openings or bottom or both, and up and down in the frames to, and move air through the hive to cool, or dry, to cool it if it's too hot or to dry, dry honey as they're curing honey, they actually make the air move on to engage evaporative cooling. So pretty smart to consider they're the size of a pea, that they can work to maintain the temperature that they want and the humidity that they want in the hive within limits. And again, over, this is all over, these jobs are all overlapping. Some of them go and do some jobs and some of them go to the others. Uh, 12 to 35 is wax making. So they're building comb, they're, they're producing wax so that you can build comb. 18 to 21 is guarding the hive. And, see, and this is interesting because at this point, their sting is fully developed. They, their venom is strong and they're capable of defending the hive. And 22 to 42 and beyond is foraging. And they literally fly themselves to death. As you'll see them come back to the hive, the older ones will, won't have any hair left. They'll be dark and shiny. And in fact, their wings will look shredded. And, probably, and for most of them, what happens is they leave to get nectar and can't fly home at some point. And that's how, that's how their life ends. The drones, everybody complains about drones. They eat, they eat, they eat, and they don't do anything. And they're, they're big, they're like racehorses. They're big, high-performance bees that 
the workers have to take care of, just like the queen. They don't bring any pollen. They don't bring any nectar in. They don't even have stingers, so they can't defend the hive. But they are important because they're what's responsible for carrying on or passing on the genetic material of that hive to the next generation. And in fact, the hive wants a certain percentage of drones. And they will work to, to produce that and maintain that population. And in fact, some, you know, some studies, because some people tell you to remove the drones, get rid of the drones because they're just wasting, you know, they're eating honey that you want to take. But some studies have shown that the bees produce are more productive with the drones there, enough more productive to make up for what the drones eat. So that's, that's really not a, an issue in truth. Um, the poor guys do get kicked out in the fall. No, nobody, want, nobody wants them around in the winter when there's no more food coming in. And so you'll, you'll actually see them being pushed and dragged out by the workers and trying to get back in. And their, their entire purpose, as I said, is to reproduce. So, and when they reproduce, they die. Their, their um, reproductive organs are actually the mod a modified stinger. And just like the worker leaves her stinger behind when she stings you, the drone has to abandon a hunk of his anatomy to when he breeds. And that serves a kind of a dual purpose because it acts to prevent other drones from breeding with that queen. So he's kind of trying to protect his genetic heritage. And the, the workers will clean that out of her and she can go back out on more mating flights. Let's see. And the, the life cycle, I'm, gonna run, I'm running out of time here. The life cycle, it's, um, they, it's about 24 days from, ha from the egg being laid for a drone to hatch, 21 for a worker, and 16 for queens. The eggs, you'll notice the pictures are like rice, one per cell. And they're, they're fertilized, as we said, are, are female, and unfertilized are male. So the males are actually male clones of the queen. They only carry her genetics. So it's an interesting difference to breeding dogs or horses or chickens when you're considering what genetics you're passing on. The drones only carry, they're, they're considered haploid. They only consider, carry genetic material from their mother. And, and the, I, think, I, can't, I won't tell you what page it's on now because I don't know. But the larvae, it's three days after, after the egg is laid, it, it's, it hatches into a larvae. At day five, the workers seal the cell and it spins a cocoon. And then 12 days later, if it's a worker, it chews its way out. And the, the chart on page, what is my page 35, which is 40, has the, the, the breakout and it shows you, compares the days and shows you the development of the eggs into the queen. So that, that makes it really easy to see the difference in, in, in terms of who develops and how fast and, and what size. And I think I'll stop there and feel briefly any questions you might have before Jane takes over again on um, considerations for the apiary. Terry's got a question over there. So are there all different bees at all different levels of development, like the worker bees? So there could be like, a, what a percentage of them could be born then? I mean, It's, it's a rolling, and you hope anyway, it, it, that, that there's a steady like, a, like an escalator. Somebody's always, every day somebody's hatching, because she's laying, in, in summer, she's laying 1,500 eggs a day. So okay. theoretically, there could be 1,500 workers and drones hatching every day. Okay. And but each individual one goes through that cycle of the dates that you said, the first five days they do this, and then? Well, with, with the exception of, you'll notice that a lot of those dates overlap. So... A bee that becomes an undertaker may not end up um, doing queen, you know, waiting on the queen. Those are those middle jobs are all possible jobs, and they're really flexible because if something happens and a bunch of bees die, then the rest of the bees don't stop doing that work. They 
it, the work stops being done and somebody goes, oh, I've got to do this, and they switch jobs. So because a bee, say a bee was foraging and, it, and they need more water, because they'll actually do that. They'll bring water back to the hive and fan it to cool the hive. Well, if it's cool so they don't need that, then those bees don't just sit there and wait for it to get warm so that they need more water, they'll go do something else. And the, so the hive's very like, dynamic in its response to environment. If, if there's not any nectar, but lots of pollen, that's what you're gonna see them working on. And it's kind of a, an amazing thing to think of 20 to 60,000 bugs working as a unit. That's why they call it a, a super organism, because they behave as if they, they have intelligence. I have two questions about the queen. When she leaves on a mating flight and she has her these pheromones that she's emitting, how far, how far out would it affect drones? I mean, how far would drones come to find her? Several miles? Or? Well, that's a good question. Um, and I won't tell you I know the exact answer. They have what are called drone congregation areas where the drones already go to gather. That would be drones from a number of hives or a wild Exactly. Drone. And if you ever find one, I know Pete wants somebody to call him. <laughs> and and yeah, it would be, it would be, because I've never seen one. And, and there's somehow the queens are able to fly within range of attracting the those. The queen goes to them or they come to her? It's, I think, a, a mix. She leaves the hive and, and it's quite high. Is it two, two or 300 feet? Yeah. Again, it's all set. <laughs> yeah. It's what, Jenny? Here I am. The corner with the red light on. <laughs> she's open for business. <laughs> One other question, having to do with the queen then. If, if she's mating with the drones from her own hive, then she's mating with her brothers, right? Her ha it would be her half-brothers. And normally that's not an issue because these drone congregation areas are very mixed. And in fact, the drones within her hive may only be half hers. Oh, that's right, because if the queen is mated with a dozen drones, then the semen that she's using on an egg may not necessarily be the same egg to egg. Well, she doesn't use the semen on the drones at, at all. The, the, reason that the, drones, the, the reason that the drones within the hive might not be her children are because for some reason, which actually makes sense, but for some reason the bees know that it's good to have genetic variety, and the guard bees are pretty lax about keeping drones out. They'll drive other workers away, but a foreign drone, yeah, they let them in. And it, it acts to have this genetic exchange between all the hives in the area. And you'll find that as you have hives, say you have hive, all your bees are light colored Italians you'll find dark drones in there. And you're like, where did these guys come? And it's because... I did last summer. Yep. That's what I was puzzled by. Yep, and it's because the guards let them in. And they don't kick them out until fall when they decide they don't want to waste the food on them. Is there another... Take it away. Five minutes. Um, just want to point out, Terry's question was a good one. And it has significance, and not that as new folks starting, you're not apt to want to go home and memorize, well, you have, you know, eggs, and then you have a larva, and then the next stage is this, and, and get those times in your head. But I will tell you the significance of that, because when you're now going into your hive, and you pick up a frame, that will happen and you in real life too. Look at the frame, and all of a sudden, one week you're looking and you see, hmm, there are some eggs, and there's some young larvae, and here are some real fat C-shaped larvae, and here's some emerging new bees, and that all means things look good, right? You go back two weeks later and you pick up a frame and you look and all of a sudden you're not seeing that real young larva. In fact, you're hard pressed to find even fat, juicy C-shaped larva. That's what is going to register in your mind that, hmm, something doesn't look right there. So it is, you want to see that rolling calendar of event life on your frame. 
So it's good to know what you're looking for because when it changes, that should immediately stop you and have you look carefully and then try to figure out how come. Is there a queen? Is there whatever? So th that was a great question because it really does have significance in your herdmanship uh, and oversight of, of your hive. That Quick question. up another question then. Does the queen lay her eggs in a block or does she randomly lay them in an area? Most, most of the time it's dead center and she's looking for open space. So she'll lay like 50 eggs in one block. Yeah, and then they're all... Come, they'll all emerge, right? And then you've got the little worker bees that are, are feeding and then cleaning and getting it ready, and she comes back. So she's, she's going frame to frame, checking out where's their space. And again, significance of that is end of spring, beginning of summer, not so much for this year for you, but for the next year when you're looking at your hive in end of April, beginning of May, We'll talk about the whole idea of swarm prevention and being able to come into hive and look. Is it too congested? How do you know it's too congested? How can you know? And and what are you going to do when you find that it's too congested? So, but you're absolutely right. She's she's not apt to. I mean, she'll lay eggs here and there, but there tends to be a general area that you're looking. So before Adam kicks off talking about packages versus nukes, you already will have made a decision about where you want your hive. And so <coughs> considerations in setting up your hive, first and foremost, you want to be able to get there. The whole idea of ease of access is paramount. Not a big deal when you're just walking out on a nice sunny day with your tote with a couple things in it. But in fall, when you're schlepping honey back, when you're bringing syrup out, when it's muddy, when it's uphill. I mean, all those kinds of things. You want, a you want a setting where you can get to easily and work easily. So that's number one. Number two, bees don't like moisture. So you want a well-drained area. Don't put it in a low-lying area. Don't put it in a swampy area. Don't put it in an area where it may flood or in the spring when you know with now with mud season, heavy rains, you, you know your property well enough to know that you've got wet spots and dry spots. Stay away from the wet. Bees, they hate it. And it doesn't even matter that you put it on seven cinder blocks. I mean, just stay away from the moisture. Um, we talked about putting them on cinder blocks or whatever. It really doesn't matter. I like 24 inches. I've been plagued with skunks. My hives are on double cinder blocks and they still bug them. So don't go any lower than that. I mean, at least 24, um, not a whole lot closer to the ground. Um, you want areas that are safe for bees, and that sounds silly, but if you have livestock, horses love to rub, <laughs> cows love to rub up against things like hives. So even though you might have grand pasture land, you don't want it in the midst of where goats are running, cows or anything like that, because you're just, it really is an invitation for trouble for, for you and the livestock <laughs> as well. Um, face your hives in the southeast. I went there with my compass. I mean, I know east and west pretty well, but that southeast got me, got me a little, I, I couldn't quite get it. So there I went looking for southeast. And southeast is grand because the hives get early morning sun. You want your, you want your bees up early. You know, you don't want them loafing till 10. You want them <laughs> sniffing around, 8.39, hives are getting warm, sun's beating down, it's a lovely day. You want them thinking about going out to forage. So the, you, that's where you want it facing, okay? So look for a, that nice hot area and, and put the opening of that hive there. Free of obstruction in the back part of your hive. And I know Jean talked about you can work your hive anywhere you want except the front of the hive. Um, I, I work my hives from behind for a couple reasons. Um, you saw what happened just now. I mean, this is pretty typical of me. Um, I'm really pretty klutzy. So I'm, the bees are safer and I'm safer when I'm behind. But I, I have a better, um, I guess I have a better read of my hive when I'm behind my hive. And I like three feet between my hives. You don't have to have two or three feet behind your hive. You can have them like this close. But then what you're faced with is when you're working your hive and picking up your boxes, you don't have the ability to just simply move it off to the right or off to the left. 
And for me, that's huge. I run the big highs. And so I don't like lifting, swinging, turning. I mean, that's just a lot of risk of injury, especially as you're older. So I, I like that you have space here that you can set the highs. And the other thing that happens is that in the, when I'm, if I'm working a high, then I'm looking to do a split, like this spring. When I go in my hives in April, and fortunately, they'll all still be there. And if they're booming like they were last year, I'm going to split my hives. And when you split a hive, what you're doing is you have dismantled your box, right? And you're taking a couple hives that have nothing but honey, and you're laying them right up against the area that you're working. And again, if I don't have space to work, then I've got them lying behind me. I can't see them. I'm going to kick them. I just, visibility is huge when you're working a hive. So uh, my suggestion is give yourself room on either side of a hive and, and so that you're not feeling cramped in your workspace. We talked about the leveling. We talked about the lifting of the back. Um, as much sun as possible, you, again, to keep your hives running warm and up and working early. They don't, high, bees don't like wind. I mean, re regular wind is okay, but if you're in a situation where you're, the wind is gusting all the time, not so big a deal in spring and summer, but boy, winter, when it's cold and those, those cold winds blow, it, it, it's not favorable. So you, not that you need to change a location necessarily, but be mindful of how can you cut that wind. Wind breaks might be hay, First two years, I used hay bales until I found that four months of hay bale being rained on, snowed on, whatever, by the time you go to move it, the strings have rotted, the bales are moldy, it was just a huge mess. So I gave up the hay bale thing and then went to snow fence, the orange that just cuts the wind. And for me, that worked great. On my split rail fences that I have behind my hives, all I do is run snow fence sometimes a couple layers of it so that the opening is, is reduced even. And that, again, cuts the wind even though my hives are wrapped. It just gives that extra buffer. Good water source. If you're near a vernal stream, that's great. If you're not, no big deal. You can put out bird feeders or any kind of container you want. But you need to have something in them because bees won't just light on water. If they do, they drown. So. Not that you need to know what round stones are, but my stones are from Campobello. I love Campobello. <laughs> and the reason I brought you my stones is because they are the smoothest rocks on the face of the earth. And I fill my llama buckets with rocks, and I fill it with water, because the bees then light on the different, and I make it uneven, so that I've got water here all the time. I don't worry about bees drowning. And I like it. The other interesting thing we tried, and Peter, I think, sent out a notice to the club, and I did it one year, and they didn't like the color. But people were using sponges, pink, green, purple, you know the sponges you use for your kitchen, and just putting them in buckets like this. Again, a place for bees to light, and then they would simply just drink, either sitting off the sponge, drinking from the water, or sucking the water from the sponge themselves. The other thing people use with great success is just a bucket with sand in it and wet your sand. And the reason, and it makes no sense, but if I go to the muckiest part of my corral, where are the bees? In the mud, in the muck. But that's, and part of that is because of the salt that's naturally present in the ground. But they do like just going to wet sand and drinking. So those are just three opportunities for you to provide somewhat unnatural water sources. Bees use lots of water. They're using it for ventilation in the hive, and they're also using it for humidity in the hive. So, so water is a, is a huge, huge thing. In, I can't recall where I found this grid. Um, I can email it to you, but it's not a real big deal, other than the fact that it was a little blib on someone talking about um, the carrying capacity of the forage carrying capacity in the area that you live with recommendations of how many hives should you have based on your land space, okay? Because one of the signs that you're looking for with bees is that if all of a sudden you've got a hive that is slow to grow, not very much honey production, excessively defensive in their behavior, a 
whole lot of reasons might play into why that is true, but is it also because there's little foraging available to them? So recommendations are if you're looking to have two hives, you want at least up to a quarter of an acre. If you're looking at running four hives, a quarter to a half an acre. It's kind of exponential. Six hives between a half an acre and an acre. And then if you're looking at eight hives, one to three acres. And again, be knowledgeable about what's out in your area when you're looking at your fields. Is there a goldenrod? Is there this? Is there that? And I can tell you, I was clueless when I started. I mean, I knew some plants, but not all. But you will become so much more aware of what they like and what's out there now that you have bees. Um, but just in the back of your mind, is your forage, is your area where they will be foraging adequate enough for them? So that's the kind of down and dirty on hive considerations. I just have one question. What if you can't face it southeast? I mean, if your choice is southeast would be facing the woods or getting away from the woods to face southeast and then it would be in the sun all the time. Sun it. Sun it. It would be too much in the sun. No, summertime? not in Maine. Not if it was Florida, yeah, but not in Maine. Okay. You can count on one hand the number of real hot days, and they will accommodate. As, as Adam was talking about. I mean, if it's hot in that hive and you're running, a, if you're running this, then you know it's a 95 degree day with hot humidity and, you, and this is normally in, pull it out. But the bottom line is they will come out. They'll hang out on the porch. They'll have tea late into the night and they're working really hard to fan and, and increase the humidity in that hive so that they're keeping it that temperate. The bees will take care of that. But much, much would I would strongly suggest that you get them out in the sun, in the warmth, facing the southeast. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. What about water in the winter? They take care of that. They, they're they not coming out to get it. They go snowboarding. No, no, no. Stay in the hive in the yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The whole, yeah, they'll come out to poop. That's it. When it's warm enough. Yeah. But no, they, they're not, they're taking their water from existing moisture in the honey. Um, moisture that automatically accumulates in the hive because of the number of bodies and the heat. So, yeah, they don't, they're not coming out extra for that. When does the hive start to get active in the springtime? You know, the, day, the other day we had that 45 degree day. It was like nuts at my place, nuts. They were, they were all out. I mean, but they're not active. They're just out about defecating checking stuff out but not really there's nothing out there for them the snow is still you know all about but I don't know when they start coming active probably well, I, mean, the, I, I guess the point is that until there's flowers out there's nothing for them to do right? well you're right I mean early spring you're looking at I mean dandelions are your very first flower but they're out looking at the maple buds yeah. the alders I mean I, I'd have to look at my calendar I don't have that in the skunk cabbage is your very mm -hmm. first skunk yep yep so that's when, about? It depends on where you are. Yeah. I don't see much here, but usually end of April, maybe. But the temperature and day length. The queen started laying when the day started lengthening in February, yep. so she's already oh, laying wow. yep. in an established high. Yep. And then your, your temperature, they're very temperature dependent. Like Jane said, 45 usually 50. <coughs> they're out there, like she said, sort of sniffing around. Yeah, so. they're just... And then they go back and they tell everybody, don't go out, it's too cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other interesting things, and it makes me sad, uh, uh, and they clearly know, but a couple of days we've had kind of like borderline, it was like maybe 42, 43, but it was that warm sun and the hives that are wrapped in the black, it was warmer in the hives than, how can I say this? Many of them were out when I thought they probably shouldn't be. And you can tell because they don't make it back. Aww. You know, they just don't make it back because it's just too cold. But they go out with great fervor and then don't go too far. But um, because it's warm in the hive, it's, you know it's warm. Because you look at the dead bodies in the snow. And Maybe that's usually, yeah. It's a little bit harder when the snow's not there. Adam, nukes and packages. Okay. <clears throat> Well, most of you will be getting, who are getting new bees, will be getting them one of two ways, either as nukes or packages. And there are other ways to get bees buying whole hives and stuff or, or doing um, catching swarms, but that's not what we're, we're going to just stick to the two primary sources. And you're going to get a demonstration from Jane 
afterwards uh, when we're doing the the demonst the the little sections afterwards about how that works. But the primary difference is with a package, you're buying just bees. Typically, you get a three pound package. They sell them in other weights, but it, the most common is three pounds of bees, which is approximately nine to 10,000 bees. You also get a queen who's probably never saw a single one of those workers in her life before they put her in the package. And it comes with a, a can of syrup to keep them alive while they're being sh either shipped to you in the mail, which makes your postman very excited, <laughs> or they'll arrive from a truck from, from one, like one of the local providers will drive down to Georgia and pick them up and drive back and give you a call and say, they're ready, come over and get them. And the, a nuke, which is short for nucleus, nucleus hive, is either four or five frames, typically deeps, but they, nowadays they do offer them in mediums for some people. And it's like a m miniature hive. In those five frames, you're going to have honey, pollen, brood in various stages, a population of workers, which won't be as many as is in a package typically, and a queen that in most cases will be the mother of the brood that's in that nucleus hive. They do have something called the time of purchase nuke, where someone takes essentially a package queen and they go to their big hive and they grab five hopefully good frames of, and shake some extra bees in and then introduce that queen in shortly before you come and pick it up. But usually, hopefully, it will be a nuke where when you open it and look at it and say, wow, that's a really good frame of brood, you know that the queen you have is responsible for that. The, the advantages of, or disadvantages of the two is with a, a nucleus hive, you're kind of going right out of the gate. To, after you hive it tomorrow, there will be workers hatching. There, there will be workers developing in cells. There will be eggs being laid. The very day you, you get it, that's all happening. And so the hive's ready to expand from, the, from day one. And in fact, while you're lugging it home, there's probably bees hatching and eggs being laid. They're typically a little bit more expensive, 10 to 20%, uh, because of you're, you're buying hardware, you're getting hardware with it that the, the beekeeper who supplies them had to, had, to, had to purchase and use. You're getting developed comb, drawn comb, which is really like gold to beekeepers. The disadvantages, those bees have been exposed to like all bees now, probably they, they will probably have mites and various other potential brood problems that they will have inherited from wherever they came from. And you're starting with Varroa in various stages of development along with that brood because they come from an active brood hive. Where a package, there's no brood. And if, and if you're installing it in a new box with foundation with no cells developed yet, it's days maybe before there's enough wax drawn and for the queen to have been released usually takes three to five days and then maybe she's not ready to not happy and not ready to lay for up to a week or two after that so you get this gap of where there's no there's no eggs no larvae developing and so no place for the varroa to lay their eggs and so it causes their population to collapse and you get a little bit of a breather with a package from, from the mites. It's short-lived. Yeah. Maybe by the, by the end of the summer, that, that's gone. In the past, people would say, well, you got the first year for free. But I, I don't know if you'd <coughs> say that's even true anymore. The, the other advantage, if you're doing a different type of hive technique, like a ware or a top bar, or you're doing foundationless frames, so you don't want somebody else's old beat-up comb then you pretty much have to go with a package because then all the equipment's yours. You built it, bought it, made it, whatever, and you're just introducing the bees. So that is one advantage with packages is that you're, you're not inheriting someone else's equipment. The disadvantage, obviously, is unlike the nuke that has new larvae hatching already and you've essentially got a mini hive that is just waiting to expand, remember that, that date chart? how long it takes a worker to develop. 
flow. So you introduce a package. There's 10,000 bees of various ages. Takes one week. We'll give you, we'll give you a good, say that one, in one week the queen starts laying. Well, so a week's gone by and she laid her first egg. And now you're looking at 21 more days before you have any new workers to replace the old workers that are just getting ready to die anyway, or the ones that get eaten by dragonflies and swallows. And so a package is going to dwindle for 20 plus days. It's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until those, that, new, that first wave of brood hatches, and then, and then they can start to expand. So a, a package, on the surface at least, looks like it's, it's going to take longer to develop. You're not, your chances of getting any kind of honey or anything out of it are smaller because you've lost two-thirds of a month right out of the gate. And that, but that's not always the case. Some people have better results with packages, really prefer them. And I've even heard of people having packages that expanded incredibly and filled two deeps in honey in their first year. I would love to have that problem, but, and, and nukes are easier to deal with. The, the, the installation, which we're going to talk about, is really anticlimactic, um, and we'll talk about that when we do the, the different sections later. Um, but that's, that, that's kind of the primary issue. It's, some of it's a matter of preference, and some it's just that idea of a nuke's going to take off quicker. And a package, even though it's cheaper, is going to take longer to develop. The other advantage is you can occasionally find nuke producers locally that will produce bees that they overwintered here. So you're looking at stock that hopefully is somewhat adapted to our weather, our temperatures, and the rest of the environment we deal with. And that, that, that's an, a nice thing if you can find it, though that... Typically, that would be a premium. Okay. <laughs> don't flinch. It'll look like... <laughs> well, um, don't they sometimes make up nukes with a virgin queen? And that's going to throw a little hitch in there. You've got a period of time where she has to go out and mate and then come back and start laying. I've never seen that around here, but that doesn't mean people don't do it. Um, I mean, you can buy virgin queens through the mail, and they're significantly cheaper than buying a mated replacement queen, but obviously you're not, you're not gaining a whole lot when you buy a virgin queen than letting the bees make their own. Yeah, well, she would be mating with the drones in your area rather than the drones wherever she came from. Right. Th yeah. And, and that, that's, that's the only reason to do that is, you're, is if you're confident that the drones in your area have good genetics that, you want, that you're sure you want to pass on. And that's all a matter of, of where you live and the timing. Because if you're, if you're trying to create queens when the blueberry blossoms are in, I wouldn't even bother. Because there's thousands of hives scattered all over here with who knows what. And, and the, so the area is going to be saturated with drones from the migratory hives. But if that's not an issue, and, you, you, or, and some people specifically actually make drone hives that generate that just throw off lots of drones because they've got a good, a good queen and they want to pass that on. So in the um, genetics game, do, does the drone and the queen add the same amount of genetics to the future or is one more prominent than the other? Does the queen add more of her genetics to it? Or? No, it's, it's a 50-50. Okay. Uh, the haploid nature of drones just means that when you're mapping the passing of traits, it's, there, it's a half a generation behind what you would do with breeding mammals, and which sometimes comes in handy. Because if you have an amazing queen, you know her drones, no matter who she mated with, you know her drones are great because they're not mixed with anything else. So that does come in handy, but it slows you down if you're trying to do some sort of crossbreeding. Not to belabor it, but if the queen's only living a couple of years, what does it mean when you have a real good queen? Um, it would be 
you judge you judge a good queen other than by how how she does like her lay, you know if she lays good you judge it by the quality of her the workers you know are are they are they disease resistant uh, are they good foragers you know qualities like that and it all depends there's a whole list of what people who breed bees for a living and it's kind of like I want high productivity but I want a gentle bee well my meanest bees are my best producers, so at what point do I say, well, I'll, take, I'll, I'll, I'll put up with it because I want the honey more than I want to not get stung. And, and everybody, and if you get into breeding your own, you know, making your own queens, you'll, you'll have to make that decision. Uh, do I like this hive because it's gentle, but it only gives me one jar of honey, or because it survives the winter, so live bees are better than dead bees? It really doesn't sound like an obsessive person should get involved with <laughs> yeah. Thank God you guys are. <laughs> no, and Can somebody speak about the uh, bees that uh, will be up for a lottery? Uh, what type of they are and where they've been raised? Uh, I believe there's going to be 20. Um, I think we're going to discuss that um, after. I think, Jamie, were we talking about after the third class? Yeah, but they're from Sunshine. They're from Sunshine, so if oh. you can talk to what, how he makes the nuke, then you can give them that information. No, yeah, we, so I, I haven't talked to him myself, but... Uh, <laughs> so. Pete? Pete? How does, where, how does Sunshine do their As far as I know, they're in Florida right now, both. Coming up in a month or so. And that's that's pretty common, even for even for nuke producers to go south for the winter, whether it's Georgia or, or Florida, or because you know they can still grow bees while we're done for six months. So, so what type of bees could um, we expect? Uh, most likely, what you see. And it's almost true of almost all the producers, unless you buy from somebody who's specializing in something, is going to be some sort of either Italian or Carniolan or blend of the two. And in fact, anytime anybody talks about having pure bees, like these are pure Italians or pure Carniolans, or pure, it's, it's not true. In, unless they live on an island that's too far offshore for a bee to fly there. And the point what you're really interested in is what are their qualities. If, if you like the qualities that are typically true for Italians, then that's what you go, you're, you're looking for somebody who breeds bees that are like Italians or like Carniolans, and you're not really worried about their, the purity of their genetics because it's the, the attributes that the, the bee breeders are breeding for that matter to you or I. So these bees that are, would be coming from Florida, they're not, um, being raised for uh, pollination, or is, are they raising them for honey? Uh, I would say they're they're. He's he's raising them to sell them to other beekeepers. So what their purpose is depends on who's buying them. The poll uh, the pollinators, I'm sure, buy them to replace what they lost in the in the last season, and and in fact. For a while there, pollinators were buying packages from Australia to, to make up for their losses. I don't know if that's still the case because Australia had no varroa, so they could get mite-free bees, which is kind of stupid to buy bees that have never seen a pest and introduce them into an area that has the pest. It's, you're just expecting to lose a lot of hives the next year because you're introducing bees that have no idea what to do about it. At least the bees we have here f try and fight it. They, they don't succeed, but they try. Where do these mites come from? They were a pest of the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, which is a smaller honeybee than the European honeybee. And the people who transport bees probably exposed European hives to them and then moved those hives back, in, and it, it spread via the trade in bees, in European bees. So the bees actually, when they're flying around, carry these um, uh, 
mites with them, or how do, how do they transport? S some of them, some of them do. The, the, the mites would, the adult mites would clean, and they feed off just like a flea or a tick would, and so they can get moved from location to location that way. Um, one of, another common way is when a hive is dying because of whether, because of disease, maybe even disease that it got from being infested with the mites, that hive becomes weak and unable to defend itself. A neighboring big hive says, why do we have to make a thousand trips to flowers to make a teaspoon of honey when I can go steal a teaspoon of honey? And they steal all the honey from that diseased hive and in turn expose themselves to everything that was wrong in that hive. So, so theoretically, importing the bees from out of state, um, could that have uh, infected the, the area? Well, migratory beekeeping certainly increased the speed at which Varroa expanded across the country. It would have happened naturally, but it probably would have taken decades instead of a decade. I can tell you, we will have a lot of discussion on mites. It's probably the biggest thing that affects us in terms of management. It's a huge issue, mites and virus. So I would we'll have about a whole evening just to that. Is that Tony's? To, yeah, that well, and I think some before just because I think it needs a little bit of kickoff before Tony comes. Uh, I just, I want folks comfortable with just the foundation of mite, the occurrence of mites, treatment of mites, how it manifests itself in the hive before Tony even comes, and, and we'll certainly touch on that. Okay. Well, put that over there. This is one example of a nuke. Uh, some of them are made out of wood, um, but this is, I think, uh, gaining more popularity because typically with the wood ones, the one drawback is they want to deposit and you have to go bring it back to them. And, and so if, if it's a long ways, that's an extra drive and an extra tank of gas or whatever to get it back to them. Um, these cardboard nukes, I think a lot of times they actually, you just have to pay for them and they become yours. But you'll see the dimensions match a deep hive. The frame in here is the exact as the frame here. So that's what you're buying. It's either five or four frames that will fit into your hive that you have at home. And you'll notice they're screened to keep them in. And typically, they'll have tape over that. And the one nice thing about this is to say you get home late, like you go drive, you pick up the packages, you get home, you don't have to do anything with it right then. You can go set this where your hive is gonna be and open the entrance and leave them alone because this is their hive and come back the next day. Or if it's raining or windy or just bad weather to do the install, you can wait a day or two. It's not a big deal. Uh, and when you go to install them, like I said, if you, if you leave them for the day, leave them in the exact same location your hive is going to be in. That way they're orienting on this is where my home is and they won't get confused. Because if you, if you put this one place and then move them over here, that night you'll find a pile of bees where this used to be going, who moved the house? Yep. Yeah, my chickens did that the same. Stupid. Yep. Um, more is better, in my opinion, <laughs> but it, so it's cost. Um, it, you know, resource-wise, obviously for the guy selling them, it, he can get, he can make more of them if he's only making four, four frame ones, and and if four is enough, then then it then that's fine. Um, and, and it's the same thing with packages. Why not buy a four pound package instead of three pound? Because four pounds is better than three. And it, it's just, it, that's where the kind of the a cost effective versus will it work kind of meets in that. In, right, yeah. And so to, to do the install, it's really, really anticlimactic. There's not a whole lot to it. You're gonna suit up and you, and it's even though you don't need to smoke them or do all that stuff, you're going to need the practice, so do it anyway. Keeping a smoker lit is one of the worst <laughs> things ever. 
Um, so you need the practice. And it's kind of fun. In dealing with nukes, dealing with hives this small, it's fun. It's really fun. Because the smaller the hive, the less aggressive they are, the less they can afford to mount an attack, so the less interested they are in being defensive. So it's, when you work with a nuke and you think this is how it always is, you're, like, what's, you're gonna be like, what's the big deal? This is nothing. Why do people even wear bee suits? They're, they're, that, they're that gentle. But you're gonna set it up beside your hive and if you buy a hive and it's kit, typically you're going to have 10 frames. So you're going to take out five of them and save them for later. And what you'll usually see, and, it, and it's all a matter of personal preference, is you see people leave five in the middle open. You could do five on one side. The bees will deal with it. But the most common, and in fact, I like to do it one to a side, but the most common way you'll see is open in the center, because a lot of times that's what you'll see. If you introduce a package, they would colonize probably the center frame first and work out. But I don't like to give them choices, and so if I put them on one side, then they're all going to work on the very next frame, and they're all going to work on the next frame. Instead of if you put them in the middle, some will work on this way, some will work on that way. They'll, they'll get it all done in the end. but. And typically what I do is take one or two frames out that you're going to put back in just to give you room to work with. And after, after you, know, you puff a little smoke, and actually a really good, you can look at YouTube videos and see people smoking a hive, but it doesn't take a lot. You punch a little in the entrance, open the cover, puff a little in, close the cover, wait for 30 seconds. And I would, what I would do is I'd do that, and then I'd go get this set up. And then a mi <laughs> Ah, Pete. And, um, and so after 30 seconds, a minute's gone by, you can pop that cover off. And they're not going to get too excited. One or two might check you out. And the key is being careful pulling that first frame out because you don't want to roll the bees between the two frames because they only leave between a quarter and three-eighths of an inch of space and they're almost a quarter inch thick. So you, you, you don't want to kill them that way. So taking out the first frame is the hardest. After that, it's nothing. But generally the queen is going to be near the center with as much protection so you start on one of the outside frames, if you can. And you'll take your hive tool, which looks like a pry bar, a little, a little teeny pry bar, and you'll, you'll break the glue, because what they'll have is these, the frames will be like this, and they won't come apart. So you'll, you'll stick it and crack it, crack it, and then you'll work on prying it loose. From it. And these won't be too bad, because they haven't been in here that long. And it's cardboard. It's not gonna. It's not gonna hang on like wood would. And then you pull that frame. The drawback is a lot there. They're kind of flexible, so they might not fit. And you pull that first frame out. And literally set it in the box. It's that. It's that complicated. And as Jane mentioned, you want to keep the frames oriented and ordered the same way the bees have them. And now this would be a good time to take a marker and mark the front. And you can do that while they're in the nuke. Just take a Sharpie and, and do, make an arrow, whatever kind of code you want to do to keep it straight. And then as you remove them, you, you break it loose and move it over and pull it out and put it in the same position in, the, in your new hive. And you just go on like that. And that's why I say a package install, I mean, a, a nuke install is kind of anticlimactic. It's over in five minutes. And you're like, well, and you're like, now what? 
But one thing I really encourage everyone to do, and this is just as good a time as any, is if you have a way to um, hold a frame out, and the catalog sell them, it's a frame hook, and it hangs on the box, and you can set the frame in it and look at it. And if you've got a digital camera, take a picture of the frames, and then upload it to your computer, and then you can zoom in and look at everything. It's really fun to do that. And that's a good way to inspect your hives later on if you want to look for stuff. Because, I mean, you can sit here like that, but your eyes are only so good. And, and you, can't, you can't sit there and inspect every speck of every frame in if you have five hives and, and they're double deeps. You just, you don't have that kind of time, but you can take pictures and then later on go back and look and say, oh, I didn't even notice. And you'll see, you'll see bees hatching or, or chewing their way out of the cocoons. You'll see workers uh, exchanging nectar. You might even see the queen laying an egg and all of that stuff you might miss while you're just scanning the frames. And, and that's good even if you're looking for diseases or whatever. You, you can just look at so much bigger. And, um, and then after, after you've got all five in there, if you're gonna do the center, then you just push them up against and then, and then reinstall your empties. And the reason to do that is it's a lot easier to stick an empty back in than if these were already here And then you got them like that, and then you're trying to squeeze that full frame back in between the existing frames. And even when you go back in and inspect, that's generally what you'll always do, is take out an outside frame, because that's almost guaranteed, there is no such thing as a guarantee, but almost guaranteed not to have the queen on it. And that's the one bee you don't want to squash. <laughs> and, and, she doesn't want to. She's a really bad flyer. Once, once after, after she's mated and she's laying eggs, she can't fly very far anyway. And, and so you'll almost never see that happen. The only, the only queens I've had fly away were like ones that I was trying to install. So that they didn't know where home was. And even then, a lot of times, the very first thing a queen that escapes like say, you, say you're manually opening a queen cage for whatever reason, the first place she's gonna land is probably on you. Because she's gonna fly around and go, where am I, where am I, and take a rest. And so she's... The queens aren't very, they're not very defensive, aggressive, or prone to wander. They, once after they've mated, they spend their entire life in the hive and generally never, never leave. And she, what you're going to find is she's going to go for the darkest spot. So, like, say if you pick up this frame and the queen's on there, and you go, hmm, I wonder where she is. She'll go, and tuck under the bottom to get in the shadow. So you'll play this game, and she'll tuck into the, and, and so you're like, yeah, there's no queen here. I've looked at every frame six times. And, but, and that's if you were inspecting for a queen, which is kind of outside the realm You'd, you'd work from outside, 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 and keep restricting where she might be. Because she's gonna go, she's gonna be generally where the brood is, and that's even in the nuke, when you pull out the frames with brood, that's probably the frame she's on, as opposed to a frame of pollen or honey. She's gonna be where she can lay eggs, because that's, that's her job, and that's what they want her to do. Um, any questions? What do you guys have thoughts? made this comment that the smaller the hive, the gentler the bees, and easier to take care of. So, if you have a nuke size, can you put another nuke right on top of it? Uh, you could, and some people do that for um, their their way of making splits and making more hives involves double stacking nukes. But that that doesn't that doesn't affect that part of it because a nuke sized hive. It's not the size of the hive, it's the number of the bees. So it, this is small because it only has five frames of bees. And once it gets to, if you stacked it, once you get to 10 frames, then it's as big as this. And you know, it's just when they're small, there's, they don't have the resources to devote to 
combat. So they're they're a little bit more more interested. They're more interested in gathering food and and laying eggs and protecting that. They will they will defend themselves, but they don't. It's it's no more interested in their job. Yeah, and the small and you find that with pretty much all small hives are pretty docile because they just they've got bigger things to worry about than you. Where you get a big hive that's got lots of honey and lots of pollen, and now they have something to defend. This is a resource that they worked hard for, and they get defensive. So, when you when you're moving from a nuke to a hive, um, uh, sh should it be? Uh, at night or before the sun rises, so it's uh, dark? No, generally it's a bad idea to work bees when it's dark because they can't see and they crawl all over you and they, and they will sting because they think, you know, instinctively things that bother bees at night are bears and skunks. <laughs> so you don't want to be either. And, and the other problem is because they're attracted to light, so you're going to have a flashlight, they'll fly to the flashlight. And, and it just makes, you know, it's just, it, night, I've seen, the only time people work bees at night is moving them. And even that is scary. Because if they drop the boxes, what a mess. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I was interested because uh, where I'm going to pick up my nuke, mm -hmm. they said you come before the sun rises or after the sun sets? Why that is, is because the nukes in the nuke yard are open. I see. So the bees are coming and going. So if you come in the middle of the day and take it, half of your bees are out in the field. Somewhere else. I yeah. <laughs> I mean, he'll get some free bees because they'll get, but, but you're obviously going to have a weak, a weak nuke. So that's why they want you to come. So all the, all the bees are in the, in the, uh, and then it, there's still the problem of them crawling around as they transfer the. Yeah, and they won't, like if you're driving home and they're in the car, they're not going to sting you, even if they get out. Yeah. Because you're, you're, there's nothing for them to defend, to worry about. I, I once, I drove home from Massachusetts with like 12 packages. I was riding in the back of the car with my arm holding them down. And there were a couple hundred loose bees flying around the car. They didn't care. <laughs> Every time we stopped for gas, people would back away. <laughs> yeah, because because yeah, like a, do a dozen, you'd go to the gas station and gas up, and twenty or thirty bees would come out of the door with you, and it was it was, it was kind of funny. But I guess you have to have a warped sense of humor to like that. But um, anything else about you know? I don't know. Do you have you guys made up your minds what your that they would actually transfer it into my, my deep. So just bring a deep and we'll take out five frames and put, it, put our five in. Yep. What's the best way of transfer, transporting the uh, deep that's got the, the bees in it? Well, they should be able to give you some advice on that, hopefully before you get there. Uh -huh. um, but you're going to have to have some way of strapping the bottom and, to bottom and top on it. Two minutes? So that would be just a strap. Type. Like a ratchet strap. But you can't seal it up tight. They need air. So um, one common way that I've seen people do is they'll have, it's, not, it's like hardware cloth, they call it. It's like galvanized window screen, but bigger. And you cut a piece and fold it into like a U and stuff it into, the, into where the entrance is underneath here, like in the bottom board. And, and then you let it spring up so it plugs the hole. That's not very secure. But, but the other way is to, like you'll see what they did here, is they taped hardware cloth yeah. over the entrance for transport. So you'll have to do something like that. So you're saying that if you're bringing the deep, you should bring the bottom board too. Then. Yeah, unless, I would talk to them, unless they're providing you with a screen top of some sort. Okay. And that would be ideal, would be if you had a frame, a framework, like a picture frame with window screen on it that you could strap down so the whole top would let air through because they will overheat and they'll crowd towards the entrance and they can actually suffocate themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe cover that with a towel then? Um, the, light would, the light won't affect them. The temperature might. So it's just if it's hot, you might want to shade them 
but the, the airflow is, is what's going to help them. And, and you'll notice when you do the package, when you go do the packages, it's a box with, made out of screen on two sides, and that's how they ship them, right through the mail. So have you guys kind of decided or thought about how you're getting bees? Packages? Yep. You're worried that, have, I, I know as of last week, they were still available from several providers. Yeah, the, this, I, the very first person I called, I got them. So just the top of the list, I would know, I didn't yep. have to work any harder yep. than that. If you're, if you're interested in nukes, I'd call tomorrow because I think <coughs> some people, I think if you're on the list, you'll notice they're talking, um, I think Humble Abodes is one place to get them. And they were, and they were, yeah, I'd probably call. I want to get into the foundation again because last week I didn't do a good job. There is beeswax and there is, uh oh, nobody watch. Thank you. There is beeswax and there's plastic. When you buy beeswax, you have these wonderful little hooks on the edge. And so for a, a beeswax foundation, you want to buy what's called a wedge frame. And to get that out, you need a knife because that's not cut through. And then you should take your knife and, and clip off all this extra garbage because it's a real stinker to get that back in. And then I, it was determined I should have... a. <clears throat> or relaxing in me because I couldn't get that to sit right. But that goes in that groove in that bottom bar. Then this goes here. And then with all the cunning of a female tiger, you come in here with three tiny nails and you, you nail that back in. Then, then if you have a lot of money, you can go to the catalogs and buy these wonderful little pins that when I started, they were two cents a piece, and the last time I looked, they were a nickel a piece, okay? Or you can go over to Sally's Beauty Supply in Rockland, and you buy a pound of bobby pins. There are 868 pins in here, and that's about what they cost. So I sell them. If you want some, they're, they're a penny a piece. It's, they're very expensive. But they are now slid in these holes on the ends to hold that uh, beeswax foundation in place so it doesn't go. Now, if you have a bigger one for a deep, if this was beeswax, then you put wires through these and run them back and forth. Uh, without the wires completely across the face of it, sometimes the, the beeswax deeps will sag and you've got a mess on your hand. So. Yeah, see the hole? You, you have a roll of wire and you start by fastening the end there. Right. And then you feed it through here and back and forth and back and forth. But and is all the, the wire side. on the same side? Or both sides? Well, it, if, you, if, if it terms your sutra better, you could put one on one side and the next on the back side and then the third about back on this side. Okay. What, whatever floats your boat. Okay. We do it, I, I, Rick, one of the speakers, I think. Um, he does it professionally, and uh, it, it costs a lot more. So when I was up at Humble and I was watching them mount plastic, I, I noted that um, the one end is put in the top bar and the other end is hit put in the bottom by pushing down with your thumbs, and you'll hear it snap. and you wiggle it once, side to side, I'm done. That's another reason I gave up on that. It, I can't scrape it. If, if I have bad, uh, bad problems with the, with the brood that's on it, and, and it's time to start over, I can, I can scrape that. If I tried to do that to that wired beeswax, I would tear it all apart, okay? Does that give you a hint that I, sorry, I hate 
to go plastic, but that's the way it is. Um, pardon me? Um, it's 5.1, but in several discussions over the last 10 years, I have found out that scientists are now measuring cell thickness after repetitive cycles of egg rearing. And guess what size the uh, cell comes down to after about 10 or 12 um, rearings? No, 4.9. And there's a company in California that makes this 4.9 cell. It's, it's, it's con technically, it's drawn. So you dump this into a hive, and the queen will take a look and say, boy, you've been busy, and start laying eggs after she, she'll take a quick run around that and start, pick a spot and start laying. So you're, you're advocating that type of uh, cell? I've tried it, and I would rather go with this and let them draw out the wax personally, because I can clean that wax off. This, I don't know how to clean it yet. I don't know whether a pressure washer could get down in there. And you might have to use some high solvent to dissolve the wax, and I don't want to get into that yet. I, now, is, is this frame here the, the frame that creates the comb that you can take out and package? So no. 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 That, that's... That's... That's a frame like this that has basswood rounds put it, mounted right in it. And they draw the foundation within the little basswood rounds and then fill that with, make the honeycomb and then fill the honeycomb with honey. And those are those little packages, they're called Ross, R-O-S-S, Ross rounds. That's all in the magazines. And, and if, you, if you really want to get into beekeeping, you ought to get uh, Bee Culture magazine. I was just asked what, what I would take for a queen, and I wrote it out. Gentleness, hygienic, non-swarming, mite resistant, winter hardiness, had good honey production, and the following bee species could, could fill that bill. New World, New World Carniolan, Gentle Golden Italians, Minnesota Hygienics, Buckfast, and Weaver All-American Gold Line. Oh, Cordovian Italians, too. Um, but you get information like that from bee culture. You see, I have notes everywhere. Just um, okay. Pardon me. Not at the rate I'm going. Um, we get in. We. The plastic ones. Can you harvest the comb too? No. No, because when you harvest comb, you go all the way through the foundation. Remember, I had this up, did I have this up in the air? What did I have up in, the, no, I had the black one. You put little basswood boxes in here, eight of them. And they draw the foundation in the middle of the box, draw the uh, cells in the foundation, and then fill it with honey. And then when it's all filled and capped over, you take this out and take a knife and you cut the boxes apart because they've propolized them together. Okay. That's where those... So you couldn't scrape it off with the plastic? Yeah, but you would have this mass of mashed uh, okay. wax cells, honey, so, and okay. cappings okay. Okay. that wouldn't be saleable. So in your bottom ones, you would use the foundation ones, and in your top ones, you would use for your honey. Right. Yeah, so there's the, two different kinds of frames here, and I think that's where people are getting confused. Okay. Okay. But you, the Ross rounds, you, you put them inside an empty frame like this. Okay. They're built to mount inside a certain size, sized frame. Okay. I never heard of that. Uh, Gene, Gene, well, you, you can read that in the magazines. Now, to what I was supposed to talk about before I got off on that. I have a bunch of pictures here. Um, this is a natural comb. And um, this is what they will draw out in the woods or hanging from an eave or what have you. And Jane had the circumstance last year of having one land in a cedar tree. 
And Dave, where's Dave? He took this down. He came in with a bucket truck and took it down because it was up about 25 feet. And you can see um, that's where Langstroth learned his 3 8 of an inch B space. And it's just incredible. And what? It's, it's foundation. That's just like what they will, will draw on those. Yeah, it's beeswax. Seven, six to seven pounds of honey for every pound of beeswax. So that's why you want to save. And this one down here um, was, um, this had capped drone, uh, capped uh, cells in it when it perished. So those have never hatched out. That's one of the problems with wild hives. So that's a wild hive. Adam mentioned the, the part, part of their mid-leg that carries the pollen. There's pollen. And different colored flowers have different pollen. And to make bee bread, they mix the pollen with honey. And, and in their stomach, they have enzymes that convert it to what we call bee bread. I'm sure the science knows what it is. And if you want to steal pollen, you put a pollen trap on the, on the entrance board of the hive, and it knocks off those lumps of pollen. Um, you can buy queens marked and clipped. She has the color of the year on her. There are four different colors. They rotate. for the And the, and the fifth year, they start back with the color on the first one. And they also clipped her wings so she couldn't fly in a swarm. That costs money. But it keeps her in the hive from swarming. Um, here are two workers exchanging nectar. And there's the tongue Adam was talking about that unrolls. Oh, by the way, these, these, this set, if you really like to look at them, I will loan them out to you. Here's a drone. Notice how the eyes are almost touching. These are the ones that do not have the stinger, so he could learn to pick these up at the hive and take and show it to his friends, and the friends would all run away screaming. Um, the, the, and, and the workers have a little bit of hair between their eyes, and they aren't as big. The size usually tips you off. There are three different sizes, and one of them, the queen, is the only one of her size. She has a long, oh, guess what she's doing? You can't see her abdomen, right? Guess what she's doing? She's laying an egg, yes. So let me find the eggs. This is a wonderful picture. The problem is the heat of the light's taking the picture. The egg fell over. Here, here is the egg fell over, so I took a piece of paper and cut it. It should be dead square center. And if you go in your books on page 40, you'll find almost an identical picture. And that, that egg is dead center in the bottom of the hive. See that? It's dead center in the bottom. And only the queen can get it down there. So if you open your hive and you're looking at frames. There's a picture of a guy here looking at, at bees. I need to find the one that says eggs. Um, if you're, you open your hive and you pull out a frame and you look down and you find these little infinitesimally white, everybody keeps saying a grain of rice. No, it's not as big as a grain of rice. So if you're looking for a grain of rice, go to China. Uh, here, you've got to look for the smallest, whitest, infinitesimal thing that's pointed straight up at you. It's 0.4 millimeters in diameter. It's 1.7 millimeters long. That's how small one of those eggs is. And um, this is a wonderful picture in that someone has given me the whole range in one picture. Here's the egg. My cheat sheet. Here's the egg with, and it's going to be in there three days, 
and then it's going to fall over into a bed of bee milk and it's going to become a larva for five days and then the top of the cell, see there's no fuzzy stuff here but on the sixth day it, the cell is capped and that starts spinning a cocoon as a pupa and 10 days later on the 21st day it emerges as a worker bee head up ready to go um, and this is all three on one picture there's bee bread here's a couple of wads that came in off those legs that hasn't been processed yet but that's just a marvelous picture because it has all three of them if you open a hive and you're looking down at a bunch of these infinitesimally small eggs, you're good to go. You've got a queen right hive. That means everything's all right in the hive. If you don't see any eggs, look very hard. What you do is you put the sun behind you and you tip the frame. You tip the frame this way so you're looking down that seven degree angle when you're looking for eggs. If you see eggs, you don't have to worry about chasing whether there's a queen in there anymore. You've had a queen in there within the last three days. Um, if there are eggs glued to the side of the cell, you've lost your queen. Some of the workers, being females, their hormones have kicked in and they're starting to lay eggs, but they haven't been mated. So they're laying drones. And everybody is laying eggs. You could have five or six eggs on the sidewalls in here. So the minute you find eggs on your sidewalls, you jump on one of these catalogs and find something like the Minnesota Hygienic. And if they've got them in stock, they can ship them in about a week. You don't want to leave, it, leave a hive queenless. Less meaning not, no queen. You don't want to leave, her, leave a hive very long like that. Um, when they swarm, they will leave queen cells behind that are ready to go. I can't wait to see what things look like by the time the third group gets here. They're long peanut shaped cells that hang from the bottom of a frame. If they're from the bottom of a frame, those are called swarm cells. And there'll be about 10 of them. And this is one that it was fat and happy in there until the whoever took the picture cut it open. That's, that's the milk from the bee's head glands that helps this turn into a queen. And what happens, the first queen that is uh, mature enough to get out of this. She chews her way out of it and it, le it flops open and leaves a hanging like a trap door hanging and then she proceeds to all these other queen cells and stings them. She doesn't want any competition so when they swarm they usually leave these, these swarm cells behind. If, and when I say on the bottom that means it would be right down here on the bottom of the frame. If you see those queen cells up here in the middle, it's sometimes called supersedure cells. She's not doing a good job, so the hive will take an egg that she laid in here, form that peanut-shaped cell around it, uh, put the, the milk to it, and create their own queen. And, and she will? Should you uh, let them do it? Should you let them do it? That usually is a sign there is something wrong. And I would take that sign as a, as a real help toward the beekeeper telling you there's something wrong. Um, spotty. Um, I don't know if I can find a, a comb with spotty brood on it. This is the start of being spotty. See these holes where there, there are no eggs? That's the start of being spotty. If that was maybe three times worse than that, I would be in the book um, trying to find out where the closest Minnesota hygienic was. And now there's a, even a better cross, a Russian Minnesota hygienic. Apparently the Russian bees are up in the mountains. They have learned to deal with the uh, mites a lot better than anything else so far. So that's an IPM, uh, Integrated Pest Management System of dealing with mites. Question. Yes. Um, you wouldn't let that queen take over and 
Definitely. Definitely. But let's say you, you saw a frame with, with queen cells either up here or hanging from the bottom, and you had another hive in your apiary that wasn't doing very well. You go in there with a razor knife, cut that out, and plant it in the other hive. See, that's why you'll hear two schools of thought. Get in there and eliminate all these hanging peanut cups or leave them, one or the other, because the new queen will go uh, sting her, her competition. So I'm starting to think that way too, rather than destroy what the bees do. They know more than I do. I, I will never learn what they know. I'm, I'm still... No, not necessarily. It's just for supersedure, she's, she, now this was the problem with the, with the packages last spring. It rained like the devil down there where the, where the queens were supposed to be out on their mating flights. And I don't know whether Adam said 10 to 18 matings would be a good load of sperm for a queen. But let's say they only got three mating flights in and then they got shipped up here with the package. That's why some of those queens pooped out last spring last summer and people did not have good hives. That's a real hard blow because for a newbie like you, you wouldn't understand that. And for us, it's our job to try and watch out for your benefit. You're welcome. All right, packages, packages. I love, packages are fun. Fun, fun, fun. So this is what they look like except that you're missing the bees. But they, that's, how they come. that's how they come. This is a package from a couple years ago. They come screened. They have a can of sugar syrup, and the queen cage is in the package along adjacent to the box, and adjacent to the can, just kind of hanging there. Okay. And before I even muck with that, I have, I've got everything set that I need. Obviously, I've got my frames in place, my hive is ready. I've mixed up my syrup, which is five pounds sugar and a gallon of water, warm water, mixed well and put in a container. So I've got my sugar syrup made up, I, and I do wear a veil. <clears throat> I wouldn't do it without a veil, or, so I've got my veil in. And I have got a hive tool with me, absolutely need a hive tool. So these, these are staple, there's four or six staples in these when they come. And so I'm going to just pop the top off, and it exposes the can and this tab. These are usually metal strips of some sort. I, I didn't have the original, so I made shift. But it's something that's got a long tail. And I will tell you that you want to pay attention to the tail and hold on to this with dear for dear life. Because otherwise, when you take this out, the, the cage will drop to the bottom, and you'll have to go after it. So. Purpose your oh, the fingers. Queen the queen cage will drop. There's nothing holding this. It, there's nothing attached. attached her, the, her this is attached to her box. Right. So when this comes out, she drops unless you have her. Okay. So slow, purposeful loosening of the can. Um, because they've traveled for a while, it's never this loose. I mean, they've built up wax on the corners and the end, so it feels like it sticks, and it does. But just it's just slowly maneuvering it out. And as you get it to the top, and you can feel the hesitation because of the rim, what I typically do is just hold the box one more time, gently, just a very gently tap, so that this can come out the queen cage can be shaken, and I cover it right back up. So the bees remain in the package. Why do you shake the cage if the queen is there? Because this is covered in bees. Oh, okay. Absolutely oh. covered in bees. You, they're just five, six deep. You know, they're speaking, they're talking, whatever. So I do just the gentlest of shakes. All right? And then I move over to the hive, just for, for, safe, for my sake. And, just in the event something bad happens, like who knows what, but I'm over the hive. And the first thing you're going to look at is, is somebody in there, all right? They used to, the, the queen will come either with attendants or solo. The first year she had attendants, two or three other little worker bees with her, nurse bees with her. The second year she came solo, I'm not sure why, but she did. 
Um, but anyways, you are looking to make sure that the queen is in there and she is moving around. Now, what happens is that if she comes with attendants, these are young queens. I will tell you that you're looking and you're wondering, which one is the queen? Because she's not big. She doesn't have that big, long, doesn't, doesn't have it yet because she hasn't been bred and she looks like a worker. But you will see a definite difference in the length of that thorax. But they're longer and narrower, right? So, but doesn't matter. Ish is somebody moving in this cage. That's number one. Now, the cage comes packed. You can see it's kind of three layers. The first, the bottom layer is packed with sugar candy, like a fondant. And you can see the cork in the top. There's a cork in the bottom as well when she comes. And the cork is embedded in the sugar. So what you want to do is pop the cork out with a knife or whatever, a nail, whatever. And I very often, when I did packages, was just take the nail and push it through the, the sugar. And it's just a way to assist the workers to start to eat away at the candy. Okay? Don't use a four-inch nail because you'll impale whoever's in here. Okay? And I speak from experience, not to be... I've done it. I have impaled a queen before because um, I was so concerned about being able to get through all that candy, and it was foolish. So shorter nail, just enough to make a hole. All right. Is that how she gets out? The workers, the workers will eat. That's exactly right. Three or four days it will take them. The cork is wood, but the candy, and it's, I don't have any there, but this is full of candy. Oh, so you just push it up into the candy. No, you take it out. Otherwise, if the cork, if you push the cork in, and they, they'll eventually maybe eat away. But keep in mind, the cage will hang like this, and the cork, if it goes over the top, then. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, so that's been released, and I like to put her. You don't want to put her dead center by virtue of the fact that. Your inner cover hole is dead center, and this is where your sugar syrup is. If something, if there, it's not, the, the top isn't on correctly, or there's um, excessive dripping or leakage, or something goes awry, you'll drown her. So I like to set her off, okay? Just so just, again, picture in your mind that I don't want her dead center, I want her over here somewhere. So for me, that's usually between frame three and four. And I'm gonna remove a couple highs, a couple frames to begin with. So I've determined that queen is alive. I've taken the cork out. I'm happy with what I see. I've got frame three, and I'm going to place her like this. And I just push it right into the, and again, there's not a lot to adhere to. It's just wax. I mean, but it's something. And when I've got her there, I will take a flat tack or duct tape or something, and I just tack it here so that there's no chance of the cage falling into the hive body. And then this extra, take one more, and then it's just a matter of sliding the next frame over and kind of cushioning the cage between the two frames. And it won't affect these two frames from sitting pretty tightly together. But that's what keeps the cage where I want it. And then it's a matter of just, and you can see why you tack it, because it, it does. With the, with the movement, it's apt to fall. So she's placed, frame is put up against, and I usually leave one or two frames. I usually have two out before I go ahead and get the bees inside the frame. See if I can do that. So, queen is there. Queen's all set. So now I've got a cage that has nothing in the way, and I'm ready to release the rest of them into the hive box. I'll do another easy, just an easy tap, because I want the bees at the bottom. Just gives me a little, few extra seconds. Some people will even spray, and it's a, it's a good idea, the sugar water concoction that you have here, put it in a spray bottle. And just, and you can do this early on before you've even started to think about working with them. Just spray the, the screen and it gives them something to lick. Because again, all they have is this. You have no idea whether this is empty or full until you've taken it out. Very often, because of the trip up, 
it's empty, so they haven't had food. So they're, they're hungry. So by spraying the sugar water, it gets them active and busy, and they're not thinking about you. They're not thinking about you anyways. But anyways, so light tap, off it comes, and gentle, not just gentle. And they will all fall out into the area that you've made for them here. And they just kind of all funnel down like little soldiers. Sideways, sideways. And you they will. Go into they will. Well, because they're being shaken. <laughs> I mean, there's some willingness, but I mean, I'm helping them a lot. Um, there will still be bees in this when you're done. You don't have to hang out here for a very long time. When you've gotten the majority of bees out, I simply take the whole kit and caboodle and I put it in the front, and I kind of just like yeah by the entrance. Now keep in mind, I'm already two feet up, so I've got it on something, but I've opened it. And already the bees have arrived at the front of the hive. They're fanning the smell. They're communicating with everybody in the air that this is where they are. We have landed. Queen's here. Come on in. That's already going on, you know, um, without our doing anything. So I put that there. I might. Or just a, a rock or something. And sometimes I've just, you know done this. I mean, they, they get it. I mean, they're, you know, I don't have to really, they really do smell, you know, and, and I will leave that until nightfall. They're not, nothing's going to happen when it's dark. So if I go out at nine o'clock at night, there's usually no one left in the hive other than those that might have, might have died in the transport or those that were near death. And, and that's where they, right. Yeah. And I take them away. So once they're now distributed more evenly throughout the hive, I can then add the extra frames in. And then with my hive tool, we'll end up just moving everything tightly together. Oh, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes. I mean, how, you know, until they, because they'll be out now, out and about in the air. Because now you know now they have to get their bearings in terms of where where we're not in Kansas anymore is kind of the message you know, um, so I've done that, and then I've got my inner cover, my sticks to support the and the syrup, quick turn upside down, this will drip until the vacuum sets. So you're going to have a drip, 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 right. Sometimes if you run your finger or on the bottom just to create that surface tension, it stops dripping. It'll eventually stop dripping. But you don't want to put it on there until the drip has stopped. Okay? And then I don't put it directly over the cover. I tend to offset it like this. Again, so just they have so they, and they have to come out, right. And then you've got your extra body that goes on top. You don't need another inner cover. It's just this and the top with a rock, with a lid. All right? Now, the other thing that people, I think Adam does it, and he likes it, and I've, there's, again, I'll just show you a couple, uh, another option, is that rather than doing the shake at all, these package boxes come. You can see the staples. These are just thin little pieces of wood. People will sometimes just take the, these off altogether. And then what you do is you just simply, at this section, right, or this juncture, where you've got two frames out, this is just placed like this. And you simply lift. You like that? Yeah. You just simply lift up the screen, and they'll just join it. And they just come up. So there's. You, you can put that if you'd rather. Doesn't matter. I mean, you know, you want them out. But it's just again, it's more direct, less shaking. People have taken the ends off. Any variety of things, but there's not a whole lot holding this together. So um, that's just another option. If you know if you don't want to do the shake method. And the other thing that I passed out in your handout had to do with calls is the Hansen method. And that is no shake at all. It's just kind of a neat way of what they do is you need another 
hive body. That's the only disadvantage of this method is that this is off to the side. You're starting with an empty box. So you've already done, you've put your queen in, you've got this whole little box all together ready to rock and roll. And what they do is that they're at the same place as we were before we took the top off and dumped them or lifted the screen up. This is simply put in the bottom. This comes off. Box of with queen and frames go on top. And you do just what you would normally do. Inner cover, sugar, but you need another box. So it's another piece of equipment. And then would you eventually remove the bottom box? Yes. And so if you do this, then the next day, you're and that's, from my vantage point, that's a disadvantage. Because you've now mucked around with the hive now in a pretty close proximity of time. The rule of thumb is don't go in this box for four days. But now you've got this empty, right? But the next day you'd come in, this comes out, this comes out, you have no need for this, and then the hive gets put back. It just seems for me a lot of handling. Um, but four days, give this queen four days before you check on her, right? It will take that long for the workers to eat through for the candy. So four days is up. This is when you might want to smoke. No need to smoke that first day. The bees, there's nothing for them to defend. They have no idea where they are. In the meantime, we've lost our queen. Um, here she is. So day four comes, smoke a little in the front, at the holes, lift the cover, smoke, wait a minute. You've got your veil on. You've come to check on the queen. Nice to get in the habit. When you work a hive, you're going to find that the easiest thing to do is, and this is after they've built up their propolis and now the frames are all sticking one to another. You're going to have to come in, again, release the frames. But it's nice to know that when you're working, you're going to either take frame one or frame two out each time you work. This is what creates space in your hive. When they start working, if you're going into the middle of the hive, what are you disturbing right off the bat? Your queen and the brood, right. So get in the habit of taking that frame one, frame two out, and then everybody slides. Less squishing of bees, less disturbing them as a colony. And you're going to come, take off your little tack, and look. Hopefully she's not there, right? If she's still there, look at her carefully. Again, she's moving. All right, you need more time. You have you got your nail with you? Dig out more of that candy. Tell her, you got 48 hours, sweetie. Put her back in, close her up, two days go back. If she's not released then, something's wrong. I mean, like, she's the, the light's on, but nobody's home. Because she should be out, right? But by then, she should be out, all right? If she's not out, let her out. You know, just let her out. You've got, and these are just two little staples, right? No sweat. Do it over the hive so that if she tends to all of a sudden get a little excitable or whatever, I mean, she just gets let out over the frame and in she goes. I will tell you that that's a queen, though, I would be watchful about. I would be wondering, what, what is she thinking? I mean, why did it take her that long, right? It doesn't matter. But... That's when you just close up shop, give them 10 days, two weeks, or whatever before you go back in. If she is dead, if that second look, she's not alive, you need to get on the horn and get yourself a queen. Don't, they're not going to raise anybody up because there's nothing there to raise. There are no eggs, nothing, 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 nothing. So call, get a queen, keep doing what you're doing. Keep feeding. They will suck this down four or five days. So keep be wa if even though you don't go in the hive, check your syrup at least once a week. What time of day do you switch the syrup? Doesn't matter. I do it when you know you're not going to do it at night when it's dark. I mean you're going to do it that nine to four time. I would, um, and keep feeding. Feed when the first box you have. If you have seven, eight frames that they've drawn out, awesome. Put the next box on. 
get your next box up with 10 brand new frames that they need to draw out. Keep this sugar going until you have the second box with eight to nine frames drawn. Otherwise, you're asking them to bring in neck to whatever it is that they need to bring in to just build foundation. Big waste of time. Feed, 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 feed. Right, when they have drawn that out, box number two goes on, full of 10 more frames with plain foundation. Keep this sugar going, more sugar. Keep going until that top. When they're now at frame, everything's drawn out except the last one or two. Sugar comes off, and what goes on in its place? You betcha. This goes on with brand new foundation. That's when your sugar stops. You don't want now, you want this to be pure. You don't want to be tainted with syrup. You want them to draw out their own foundation and fill it with honey. So that's kind of your, that should be your gauge. But keep feeding until those two, do, two boxes. I'm sorry. Does that have frames in it? The top one will have frames, shallow frames? This? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. And do you put a top on there so the queen doesn't get up in there? She, she won't. You do put an inner cover on. Inner cover. Yes. So it would be frame box one, box two, honey, medium, super, inner cover. I don't use an excluder. That queen's busy. That queen should be down here working. She, the only, what would make her come up to the super? Any idea? What would force her up? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And your first, and with a package not apt to happen, is it going to happen with a nuke? You betcha. That's what you have to be so watchful for in terms of a, starting with a nuke because you already have this explosion of bees. That queen is laying like a crazy woman and she's going to be filling this up in no time. And if you're not watching what's going on, They'll either swarm or she'll come up into this box and muck it all. I know we talked about it last week. Don't be shy about getting your name on list for bees. Even though the club purchased the, or, or set aside the 20 nukes, it's, again, it was just kind of the thought of having something for safekeeping. But I really, if you are looking at getting bees and starting with bees this year, Call everybody. Let them know that you're a new beekeeper. Let them know that you want bees. Get your name on that list so that, again, we have as many of you covered as we possibly can. Don't be shy about that. Someone asked about equipment. You can get equipment at any time. I know that Peter will be taking or meeting a group out at Humble Abodes on that Saturday. Part of that is just for you to see um, a working operation going on making the equipment but also it's an opportunity for you to purchase then and there plenty of time packages arrive middle of april so this is what three four weeks almost peter before plenty of time to assemble and paint should have all your painting done several weeks before so it's cured and it's not smelly those of you that are getting nukes that's your well now a uh, whole almost a month later so there's plenty of time to get equipment if you don't want to order it by a uh, mail company and pay shipping again you've got local folks but just again be thinking about the kind of equipment you might want look through your catalogs someone mentioned catalogs are great got all sorts of stuff in it but you know Really, honest to goodness, you need a veil, you need a tool, you need equipment, um, a smoker, and I don't know, probably not much after that. So don't get way late. Oh, and the green alcohol. Yes. Wintergreen alcohol. Great. Yes, it's a wonderful thing. Yep.